My name is Richard Dockery. I teach at the uh, University of Dallas uh, in Texas, and I'm delighted to be part of the Teachers Academy uh, this summer. And I'll be giving a talk today uh, about the 2000 election uh, and the sort of the significance of it, the aftermath of it, what, what happened, uh, the, af the aftermath of the election itself um, as that moved forward. Um, and uh, then um, see what, what the significance of the, of the election might have been. Um, but before I get to that, uh, I want to talk about one other thing uh, first, since the uh, uh, program as I uh, see it, um, your most recent talk was on the 1912 uh, election. Uh, a lot happened in the, in the meantime. Um, in regard to the election system itself. And so I wanna just briefly uh, talk, about, uh, talk about that. And then that will lead me into saying something about the sort of uh, character of the, of the 2000 election and then the, the controversy uh, surrounding it. So the one major, I, I guess I, what I would focus on first is the, the one major uh, change, the largest change really, um, from uh, over in the in the course of the 20th century was of course the introduction of the primary system, right? And what happened uh, as a consequence of the primary system um, was the uh, opening up of uh, campaigns uh, within uh, the uh, parties. <clears throat> uh, the con so so uh, so that by the end of of the 20th century you have this basically open system. Um, where anyone can uh, put themselves forward as a potential candidate, uh, try to capture the uh, nomination of, of the party. And uh, well, it's uh, somewhat exaggerated, I think, to say that the parties have no control uh, over that arrangement that is of the, of the, the, the nomination process. Uh, it is an exaggeration to say they have no control over it. They have lost a good bit of control over it. And there are some consequences for that. Um, so let me just say briefly uh, what I think are some of the advantages of the new system and then some of the disadvantages uh, of, that, uh, of that system as they've developed over uh, basically the last century. Um, so the main advantage I think of the new system, the primary system um, is as, uh, as I suggested, the sort of opening up of the nomination process to uh, those who are, are called in the business outsiders, right? The outsiders are, are people who, um, for example, have not been in the public eye uh, in a significant way, certainly not, not, not politically. They haven't been um, longtime candidates, uh, served in office a long time. Um, they haven't been sort of standard holders for the, uh, for the party. Um, <clears throat> But, but rather, uh, you know, you think of someone like uh, uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, one-term governor of, of Georgia, um, Ronald Reagan, sort of a grassroots uh, Republican, uh, had been out of office by the time he won the nomination in, in uh, 1980, had been out of office for some period of time. Um, and so, and, and, and under the older system, um, the part, what we call the party system of nomination, um, these are likely people who would not have won the nomination uh, of the party. Um, the most uh, uh, significant, I suppose, ex notable example uh, uh, of that re more recently, of course, would be someone like Donald Trump, who uh, wasn't even a member of, of the party uh, for a number of years uh, prior to uh, announcing himself a as a candidate. So again, that's the, the advantage there is there are people who, uh, who might have uh, something to offer, uh, and, and who, uh, who are gonna become candidates that the people have a chance of, of choosing and, and that the party doesn't have, have control over. Uh, another advantage of the new system um, is um, that it requires, uh, it requires a kind of ambition uh, on the part of candidates. And ambition is a, uh, can be a, a problem, right? Um, sort of overwrought ambition can be a problem. Um, but ambition is also a characteristic that the founders thought uh, was important, especially the ambition of an executive. Um, and in, that, now that doesn't mean, uh, I don't mean by that, and I don't think the founders meant by that, 
um, ambition to do something extravagant, et cetera, but rather uh, I would say it's an ambition uh, to fulfill the office of the president. Right? The way I would describe it is uh, ambition to exercise the powers that the president has been given. Um, and perhaps it's the case that the kind of ambition that's required to acquire um, the nomination of the party uh, might, be, might serve the purpose of promoting that ambition uh, of the office holder. So not necessarily the case, but it's not unlikely. Okay, a third advantage of the system is because it is a, a longer uh, period of time that the candidates are, uh, are, are in the public eye, uh, we might get to know them better. Uh, than, we, than we did under the older uh, party system. And fourthly, you might, you might say we might get to know better their intended plans uh, or their agenda, right? Um, so rather than, it, rather than first hearing about them in June or July or August of the year that the election is gonna take place, um, we know about them, you know, they're announcing two, three years ahead of time and we can investigate them and find out what they think about this, that, and the other thing. And, I might say we have a much better sense then of how they might actually govern uh, as a result of that. Okay, but I think there are also some disadvantages to, to the primary system. Um, and I'll mention just a couple of them. One is it's very expensive. Um, you know, if you're gonna run in the primaries today, you're gonna do so uh, successfully, you've gotta be able to raise money. You gotta be able to raise a lot of money uh, just to be competitive. You know, fifty or hundred million dollars is a is a is a good uh, start in that in that uh, regard. Um, so that means you're going to spend a significant amount of time and energy, right, raising that money. And the people who are donating to you are going to want to have some kind of say. Uh, secondly, as I mentioned, as an advantage of the system, it's it's a long uh, process, and it's also a long and drawn out process, which might be a disadvantage. There's a sense, I think, in which people get worn out. Um, uh, it, uh, with the process. So think of how many, uh, you know, if you have 15 or 20 or 25 candidates and how many debates there are, and you have to have more than one debate because you can't fit everyone on the stage, et cetera. Um, it can get hard uh, to even follow you know, such things, even for those who do it for a living. Um, but I, I think a, a, a more important problem uh, that that's a consequence of the primary system is what I would describe as a sort of loss of uh, party support for governing. Um, and that results from what I think I'm describing as an advantage of the system, it can become a disadvantage. So the advantage is that you, you can run as yourself, right? You don't, candidates don't really run as the representative of the party. Right, it's you know, vote for me because I'm Donald Trump, vote for me because I'm Hillary Clinton or I'm Joe Biden or Barack Obama, whatever it might be. Not, I am the candidate of the party. And of course, they obviously are the candidate of the party, but uh, they're, really, they're really independent actors in that regard. So again, nothing, nothing necessarily wrong with that, except that once you get into office, right? So you've run on your own, you've often run maybe against Washington, like saying there's something problematic with it, you, you wanna clean up that mess in Washington, whatever it might be. And now you're faced with governing. And so you don't have, because you, again, you've run this sort of independent campaign, you don't have party support behind you necessarily. And it might be very difficult for you to accomplish uh, your agenda, right? Uh, in, in, uh, in, in your administration, uh, when you don't have that body of, of party support in Congress, right, that's, that's on board with your plan, right? So of course the parties still have platforms uh, which they put out during the uh, campaign, normally uh, approved at the time of the uh, convention uh, over the summer, um, but the a party platform isn't really binding um, certainly not on uh, the presidential nominee uh, in any significant way. Um, and so they're, they're not tied to it. And the members of the party in Congress are not really tied to it them, themselves either. Um, and so again, it just, you, you don't have that sort of pool of support uh, that you can count on. And we've seen that, right? Uh, it makes it difficult for uh, presidents to get their agenda. Um, uh, through through Congress because they don't have that they don't necessarily have that 
uh, basis of, of, of support. So, so there's a kind of disconnect that I would suggest that, that, uh, that results from the distance between the um, nomination process and, uh, and governing. Right? Those, are, those are two different things. It's one thing to be, a, so you could put it this way, I'd say, it's one thing to be a good uh, candidate. Um, it's maybe something different to be a good president. Right, a good administrator, uh, and and we I think it's worth keeping that in mind. Okay, with that having said that, um, I want to turn though to uh, talk about the uh, 2000 election. So I begin with what I'll call uh, the common practice, um, maybe the usual suspects, right, the, of the way things operate. So I would describe it this way, right? There was very little and the buildup to the 2000 election that suggested that novel claims and arguments and historical anomalies were about to occur. Uh, the two major parties nominated well-known and respected politicians, the sitting vice president for the Democrats, Al Gore, a former Senator from Tennessee and the governor of Texas, uh, George W. Bush uh, for the Republicans whose father, of course, had served one term as president before being defeated in the 1992 election by Al Gore and his presidential running mate, Bill Clinton. The election cycle in 2000 pretty much mirrored what had happened routinely over time, uh, some jockeying for position between the two candidates uh, and polls from the summer on suggested that the election would be close. Uh, with, with Bush holding a relatively steady lead after the Republican convention over the summer, he got a significant boost from the, the, the convention, but with Gore hanging very close uh, to the front runner. The race was complicated a bit by the presence of third party candidates, uh, most importantly, Ralph Nader uh, representing the Green Party. Uh, and that fact became somewhat important uh, in the election aftermath. And uh, if I have time, I'll say something more about that. But we get to, so we get to the, the night of the election, November. Uh, it was clear that the vote was going to be close. And in the end, came down to the Florida election returns. So the state was called, so, so, so without Florida, neither Bush nor Gore could uh, garner uh, the 270 electoral votes that they needed. So they, they each needed to win it. So the state was called for Gore early on and the 20 electoral votes would have given him the 270 that he needed. But as the results continued to roll in, the race tightened and the networks retracted their call for Gore, then called the state for Bush and Gore conceded the race. But uh, this is late into the night now. Um, it turns out that heavily Democratic counties in Palm Beach, Miami Dade County, and Broward County were still counting ballots. And as those results were made public, Gore withdrew his concession, right? Seeing that it was actually too close to call in, in his view. So this is where the fun begins, uh, so to speak. Um, Florida law, as is the case in many states, uh, allowed for a recount in a close election and the Gore campaign requested such in four counties uh, in Florida. Uh, the Florida Secretary of State, Catherine Harris, so she's the one who has to certify the vote right, as, it, as it comes in. Um, she announced that she would accept any revised totals that were uh, turned in by uh, November 14th, uh, that November 14th was the state, the state established statutory deadline for recounts. Uh, a, the, the Gore campaign brought a case to the Florida Supreme Court challenging that, that is challenging the November 14th deadline and the Florida Supreme Court ruled uh, in favor of extending the deadline to November 26th. Um, well, when the by the time that the, um, uh, the that the November fourteenth deadline rolled in, 
uh, Miami-Dade County halted its recount and resubmitted its original total to the state canvassing board. The state canvassing board was the one that had to certify the results. And Palm Beach County failed to meet the extended deadline, um, turning in its uh, completed recount results at 7 p.m., uh, not 5 p.m. And uh, Harris, uh, Sec Secretary of State Harris rejected the submission. Uh, on November 26th, then, the state canvassing board certified Bush as the winner of Florida's electoral votes. Um, and uh, that by 537 votes, so very close. Um, and that certification would, would give Bush the 20 votes, the 20 electoral votes then, and then put him over the top uh, to give him 270 electoral votes. Uh, Vice President Gore contested those certified results as of November 26th and appealed to the Florida Supreme Court, which ordered a, a which ordered a pause on the um, uh, uh, on the certification uh, of the electors and ordered a continued recount of at this point of over 70,000 ballots uh, which previously had been rejected uh, by machine counters in the end, so, so the, 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 the recount is going on then, right? Um, but that recount finally gets ended by the US Supreme Court, um, which halts the, uh, the, the recount on December 9th um, of 2000 and takes up the challenge to the certification by the Gore campaign and then issues its opinion in the Bush v. Gore case. So this is the, the, the decisive case uh, the Bush v. Gore case is decided on December 12th, 2000. So this, what is the court, what's the case dealing with? Uh, so again, this is the Bush v. Gore decided on December 12th, 2000. Um, the court issues a per curiam opinion. So per curiam opinion simply means that it's unsigned. Um, so no, no, one, no one is uh, listed as the author of the opinion. Um, it's meant to apply, as, as we'll see a little bit later, to apply to this case and perhaps this case only. Um, that's a, uh, an interesting uh, question. We'll say more about. Um, and uh, the court is really faced with two questions uh, in, in Bush v. Gore. The first is whether the Florida Supreme Court had changed Florida election law by altering the deadline for when a certified vote count had to be submitted. That is first by extending it to November 26th and then extending it so that the uncounted or undercounted uh, ballots could be, uh, could be counted. So again, the first question is, has the Supreme Court changed Florida election law? And, and actually the court doesn't address that, but I'll say something about it in a moment. It abandons that question. Um, in the procuring opinion. The second question, which is the one that the court really uh, relied on, was whether the uh, Florida Supreme Court remedy uh, during the recount, that is its order that the recount go forward, whether that violated the due process clause and the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. Why would it do that in the view of the court? It would do that, it would violate especially the Equal Protection Clause by treating votes differently um, based on the claim that, this was based on the claim that the Florida Supreme Court had not imposed or provided a uniform standard for counting the votes. With the result being that different counties and even different precincts within counties we're using different practices and methodologies for counting. What, so in other words, then each vote was not being treated equally. That, that's the argument, right? Um, and so, that, so this might be seen as a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Now, as a, so, so again, whether, whether the, the, the Supreme Court had changed the law and then whether there's a violation of equal protection. Uh, in the decision though, the Supreme, in, in the issued a decision from December 12th, 
um, the Supreme Court failed to address the first issue and focus instead only on the equal protection and due process claims. Uh, but I wanna say something briefly, at least about the first issue in part because it's interesting in its own right, but also because it's an issue that's not going to go away um, as we in fact saw in the aftermath of the 2020 presidential election. Now, as I said, the Supreme Court shied away from addressing the issue because the court found the second question to be sufficient enough of a constitutional problem to answer the, the litigation. But it does raise an important question. And the question is whether the Florida court had acted in such a way as to violate Florida election law uh, and the constitution and federal statutes governing elections uh, passed over the past 125 years. So it, in what way might it have violated uh, that? Well, the claim is this, that the constitution says in article two, section one, that each state shall appoint in such a manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. Okay, so the state shall appoint in such a manner as the legislature thereof, that is of the state, may direct a number of electors. Now the passage seems fairly clear. That is that it gives to the state legislatures the power over the electoral process. That is the manner by which presidential electors are chosen. Now historically, those electors uh, were chosen um, from the founding period on by a variety of different methods, differing from state to state, sometimes being appointed by the state legislature, sometimes being chosen by popular election from a slate of electors put forward by the state legislature, and sometimes simply by popular election. Again, that was in the early decades. Uh, by 1832, all of the states had resorted to popular election of electors with the singular exception of South Carolina where in South Carolina, the state legislature continued to appoint the electors right up to the Civil War. Uh, there are two anomalies actually historically in this regard. One is um, in Florida, it happened to be in Florida, uh, in 1868, Florida had just been readmitted to the union after the Civil War. And so the legislature appointed the electors uh, because it was so close to the electoral uh, uh, date. Um, and the same thing happened actually in Colorado uh, in 1876, it was admitted as a state so close to the election day that the state legislature uh, again appointed the electors. Uh, but again, for the most part, um, it, was the, it was by popular election. But that is the, the argument is that's to be established by the state legislature. And the claim is uh, that, that the fight by the Florida Supreme Court stepping in and, and changing that, that is altering the date uh, by which uh, recounts would be accepted, uh, then that had changed the law and it was not the state legislature um, that had directed the manner of choosing the electors. Okay, again, I'll, I'll come back to that in, in a sec. So that, again, that I think is, is in itself an interesting question, again, though the court uh, doesn't address it. So the case was decided in, in December, just prior to the meeting of the electoral college Right, in, in, which was gonna meet on December 18th. And in Bush v. Gore then, seven members of the court ruled that there was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Right, that is, there was a constitutional um, error right, uh, here. Um, and then, so it was seven, seven justices uh, 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 ruled that there was an equal protection violation and two said there were not. But two of the seven who thought that there was a violation uh, also thought that the recount should go ahead, right? Uh, that, is provide, that is what the court should do is provide sufficient guidance for counting the ballots, uh, guidance which had not been, been provided, but that, the, but that the recount should go on. But the, court, uh, but the court didn't accept that. The majority of the court didn't accept that. So it was, it was a five, so it was a seven to two decision in this sense, right? Saying that 
there is an equal protection violation, um, but a five to four decision saying um, that, that we're gonna stop uh, the, the recount because there isn't sufficient time uh, to, uh, to conduct the recount. So the court held then that the absence of standards in counting the ballots or in recounting the ballots amounted to a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. So what had happened is that, as I said, the Florida Supreme Court in its earlier intervention in the case required the counties to restart the counting of the ballot, the re to restart the recounting of the ballots. But the counties were essentially left to make their own decisions about how to recount the ballots or which ballots to count. Right, so this is where then we get the famous debates about the reading of the ballots and the holding up them, holding them up to the lights, et cetera. So that is, and why did that happen? Well, with the prevalence of paper ballots in which voters were required to punch out small pieces of paper, right, perforated paper or chads, right, from the ballot, that's what they're called, those little things. Um, there were various standards adopted in various places for whether or how to count um, what were unclearly perforated chads, right? So it's one thing if you, you poke through, the chad falls off, it's clear, there's a vote. But what if you poke through and it doesn't come all the way off? So there's, it's still hanging on to the ballot. Or in some instances, what if it seems to be poked, right? Um, but not poked all the way through so that it gets detached. So the first are hanging chads, right? The ones that are still attached, but, but somewhat perforated. The others are called dimpled chads, right? They get a little impression on them from the device that you're using to push it through, but it doesn't actually detach. So people, the, 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 the ones, people counting the ballots, they're, they're, they have to look at these and say, well, is this gonna count as a vote or not? In addition, there were differences on how, uh, being different decisions made on how to count ballots that contained an overvote, that is where more than one candidate received a vote and those that contained an undervote, uh, that is where no candidate received a vote, right? And could you tell whether or not they had actually intended to vote for one candidate rather than two or one candidate rather than none? And importantly, at this late date, that is by December 12th, it was impossible the court held in the Bush v. Gore case to meet the deadline for recounting in time for the electoral votes to be sure to be cast. Uh, that is the federal law required a safe, established uh, what was called a safe harbor protection. So the safe har harbor protection was if you got the vote in, it was certified by this date, then it would very likely be accepted um, by, uh, by the electoral college. <clears throat> so again, so the court basically says on December 12th, um, no, no, the, the vote, your, the recounting is done. Uh, you, you, should, uh, you should certify the count as it has been certified at this point. Now, Chief Justice Rehnquist writes in a, a concurring opinion in the case. And he, I mention this because he does address the first question which I mentioned, and that is the constitutional question of the state legislature being given the authority to oversee the election. Um, and his argument is that the state legislature has given the power to the, by statute, has given the power to the state secretary of state to validate the election results. And that she, Catherine Harris had done that and that should settle it, he says, right? So the state courts then in this view should not have intervened to reject that validation by the secretary of state. So as something of an aside, this will likely be addressed um, in your subsequent uh, uh, talk. Uh, this is one of the issues that reappears in the 2020 uh, presidential election contest. That is whether states had violated the law and the constitution when state Supreme Courts and or governors had altered election processes during the buildup to the 2020 election, most commonly by expanding mail-in or absentee balloting um, in states without the approval of the state legislature, right? So the argument made by Rehnquist in the Bush v. Gore case 
would suggest that such changes are a violation as the constitution, as he uh, puts it, gives the power to choose electors to the state legislature and not to the executive or the judiciary. But that's not the only view of the law uh, as, as we see. Now there are the dissenters in, in the Bush v. Gore case, um, two of them, uh, Justice Breyer and Justice Souter, uh, they're the two who I mentioned agree with the majority opinion uh, that there had in fact been an equal protection violation but they disagreed with the remedy that the court arrives at, which is essentially to shut down the recount. Um, they would rather, again, provide a clear guide or standard for the ballot counting and then let it proceed. And one of the arguments uh, that the dissent makes is um, that it, this is addressing that first question of the legality of the, of the court the Supreme, the Florida court uh, ruling on the certification of the vote by the Secretary of State, one of the arguments they make is that the Florida Supreme Court's role in invalidating the count that had been certified by the Secretary of State was in fact perfectly valid, perfectly legal. And, and, and why? Uh, well, again, Rehnquist says, um, that the, that the Constitution gives the state legislature uh, the authority to uh, control the, the selection of electors. But the argument of the dissenters is that when the Constitution gives to the state legislature the authority to construct the process for choosing electors, that it intends that power to be exercised in the manner that all power is exercised under state law. Right. That is, uh, how, how does that work? Well, the state legislature passes the law, the governor signs it, and then there can be challenges brought to the law, and those challenges are to be brought in court. And that's what had happened in this case. Right? So in other words, it, the state legislature is given the authority to control the manner of selection but it does it in, again, the argument goes, but it does it in its nor the normal course of its activities. And that normal course of activities is, right, the, the, the work, working with the governor in passing laws, and then when there are challenges to the laws that they get brought into state court. And so the argument of the dissenters is that's all, all that's happened here. There's nothing unusual, nothing strange uh, about it. Um, but as I said, the court's decision essentially settled uh, the recount in favor of George Bush and the state of Florida then certified its 20 electoral college votes for Bush. So a couple of things that, uh, about the, the, the election um, that are, I think, worth thinking about. One is that the Bush victory was the first time in over a century that a president had won the electoral college vote and lost the popular vote. So Bush won exactly 270 electoral votes, but he lost the popular vote by about a half a million votes or uh, roughly half of 1%. Uh, the result, and that result in fact was almost reversed in Bush's reelection in 2004, where he won the popular vote, but came very close to losing the electoral college vote. Uh, it has had, I think maybe I forget the number, 20 or 30,000 votes gone the other way, he would have lost it, he would have lost the election. And of course, Donald Trump repeated in, in 2016, repeated the 2000 result, winning the electoral college vote, but losing the popular vote, um, though in a much more significant way on both counts. So uh, uh, Trump lost the popular vote by about 3 million uh, or roughly 2.1%. Um, but he won the, whereas Bush lost it by less than, uh, by about a half a percent. But Trump won the electoral college vote 304 to 227. Um, so he captured 56% of the electors. Um, and, and here, I, I guess I'd say, uh, so again, that, that I think there are, there are a lot of interesting things about that one, one could talk about, and maybe that will, it, we could bring that up perhaps in the question and answer period, the live question and answer period we're, we're going to have. Um, but there's, there's another matter um, that might be worth considering here uh, in regard to the, the, the uh, election returns and the role of the court 
Um, and that is um, the kind of finality that resulted from the court's decision in December of 2000 and what the consequences of that might be moving forward. But one of the issues that have been raised routinely about the court over the last century really is whether it is viewed as a political body rather than or as much as a legal body. Right? So arguments over the role of the court in its intervention in divisive political and social issues, some really quite foundational to the American order and society have produced doubts in the eyes of some about the neutrality of the court when such issues come before it. And these doubts have in part led, as we know, to extensive debates about the question of the balance of the court and thus heated controversies over nominations to the court, with many seeing the nominees as representatives of fixed political views, views that they anticipate will be determinative for the decisions that the justices are going to be called upon to make during their tenure on the bench. So whatever amount of significance one attaches to the debate, that is whether the court in fact has become more politically charged or whether a particular justice is moved by partisan concerns and not as objective as some would like, whatever significance one attaches to the question, it's undoubtedly true that the court is perceived as being more political and less subjective. And much of the sometimes unspoken but often readily recognizable heat surrounding presidential elections in electoral control of the Senate, where Supreme Court nominees will have to get approved, surely results from the way in which various groups perceive how the outcome of the election will affect Supreme Court decisions in the near future. So one question we might consider from the 2000 election is whether the court's decision in Bush v. Gore did anything to advance or rebut the view that the court is becoming more political? And we can only hazard a guess about the answer. Undoubtedly, some saw the court's intervention and decision as politically motivated. The majority of the court members having been appointed by, presidential, by, by Republican presidents, for example. And the result of that assessment would very well be a decline in the authority of and respect for the court. The court's decision also could, and I think did, undermine the claim of legitimacy of the election result, with many drawing the conclusion that the Bush victory was somehow tainted by the courts finalizing the election count. But this, but, you know, this is a question that one can't really answer with any kind of finality itself. There's surely many, if not all, critics of the court's decision in Bush v. Gore were already disposed to oppose a Bush victory. And so we might wonder how much the force of any argument the court makes in Bush v. Gore would affect their analysis. For all practical purposes, in fact, Bush would have won the election, in my, in my reading of it, even without the court's decision in Bush v. Gore. Why? Well, because the Florida legislature which had to submit the slate of electors for the state was controlled by the Republican party. They could easily have simply accepted the secretary of state's certification of the Bush electors and submitted that to Congress. In the absence of that, um, if no one won a majority of the electoral vote, which could happen, then the decision would have been left in the hands of Congress, specifically in the house for choosing the president and the Senate for selecting the vice president. Republicans, again, controlled the House delegation and would even after the new House was seated in January of 2001, where the, it, where the selection in the House would be made by each state getting one vote, Republicans had the control of more uh, states than state delegations than Democrats did. And so the over, overwhelming likelihood is that George Bush would have been chosen president. So in whatever scenario you imagine, in my view, Bush would have won the election. And if that's true, then the court's decision to stop the recount in Florida wasn't really decisive for the outcome of the election. And perhaps the president himself 
might have been better served had the legal and political process been allowed to play itself out. Now, undoubtedly, any of those scenarios, which I've just mentioned, would have raised their own problems, but it would have been a different set of problems. Right? And I, I, I want to suggest this. It's often the case that we see the dangers of letting processes play themselves out. But we perhaps often don't see the potential problems in short circuiting such processes. Uh, that is, we might see uh, the threat that an emergency situation raises and not trust that the established set of protocols might very well address the issue, even if it takes some time and may get a bit complicated or bumpy along the way or is slightly ugly. Right? The inclination to intervene uh, that, that we feel um, can, can often be peaked and compel us to do something rather than let time and the processes sort out the problem. And, and, and sometimes we may be right. That is that the issue is not gonna get resolved and it needs some kind of intervention. Uh, but sometimes it does get resolved, right? And I'll just give you a quick example of that where things do get resolved even when you think there's an emergency. Uh, many of you undoubtedly uh, teach um, the steel seizure case in 1952, right? So Truman thinks, uh, right, the Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer, uh, Truman makes the argument that there's a, a threat of a strike, and, uh, but we need uh, the protection of steel for the, the uh, prosecution of the, uh, of the war, right, uh, the Korean War, uh, and Congress has uh, approved the uh, purchase of war materiel, so I have to seize the steel mills to make sure that there's no strike so that there will be production. Um, but um, when Truman loses the case, right, um, and uh, the court rules against him, there was a strike. Uh, and as one scholar of the court uh, described it, the strike lasted for 53 days. And yet there wasn't, uh, the, the dire consequences, um, she notes, of even a short interruption in the production of steel never materialized. Um, so it seemed like it was, um, uh, it was an emergency, but maybe it was not. <clears throat> um, but for those of you who, who might be interested in pursuing uh, this question further, um, that is of the, the outcome of the, uh, of the court decision and the recount, there is some argument to be made that had the democratic challenge to the recount and certification been extended to a statewide recount, rather than being limited to the challenge counties that perhaps Gore would have won. Uh, but again, we'll really never know the answer to that question. But the general point I wanna suggest here is this, uh, before turning to a conclusion. The general point I wanna suggest here is this, that about the election and the, the court's uh, role and intervening in the election, that in American politics, generally speaking, we're usually better served by relying on political solutions to our difficulties than attempting to rely on legal solutions when some form of crisis arises. Now, that's not always the case. And there may very well be political circumstances that are in place that make political solutions to a problem impossible or not very likely to occur. So this is not a fixed point I'm making, but a prudential or general point. Uh, that is attempts, uh, you can think of it this way, attempts at achieving a kind of finality about something that bypass the American people struggle with the issue um, will almost always be futile. So it seems to me, All right, okay. A little bit of the, uh, let me turn finally to something of the aftermath of the 2000 election. Uh, for electoral purposes, the 2000 election produced other results. One thing is uh, more states passed laws requiring that the electors who had been selected for the state actually cast their electoral votes in December for the declared winner of the statewide popular vote. Um, in many instances, so, so that's, that's true. I think uh, as of uh, the 2020 election, uh, maybe the, the subsequent uh, uh, 
talk will address it. I think there were 32 states man, maybe who mandated um, that uh, electors vote for the person who they pledged to vote for. Um, but in many instances, the state simply fines uh, the elector for not doing so, and the fine is usually not, not very dramatic. Um, but in 2016, that mandate was really flouted in a number of instances um, where there were many electors and potential electors across the country who said and did, uh, who said they would not vote for uh, the person who won the popular election and, and didn't do so. Um, and this led, uh, this led, so these are, uh, these were referred to as the faithless electors, right? So the faithless elector is the person who has pledged to vote for uh, uh, someone but doesn't actually, doesn't actually do it in the electoral college. And this led, the, the, the result of this, that is a series of, of, of people who, who didn't do this or who, who or in, in the case of Colorado announced ahead of time, they were not gonna vote for someone and they were replaced uh, as electors as a result of that. Um, that led to a series of court cases, challenging the authority of states to direct or control the voting of electors. Um, now the court, Supreme Court had, had ruled in previous cases that states can direct electors to vote in the way that they had pledged to vote prior to the election, right? You can say, this is one of the ways in which the authority given to state legislatures to direct the manner of appointing electors can be exercised. So again, the court had said, you, the state can tell them, you, yes, you have to vote for this person you've pledged to vote for. But the state hadn't, the court, sorry, the court hadn't really addressed the question of whether states could punish electors in some way when they did alter their vote in the electoral college. Um, but in 2020, they did just that, right? In, in two cases, one involving uh, the state of Washington, that was the Chiafalo case, um, and then also a Colorado case, Colorado Department of State versus Baca, um, that the state could find someone uh, or they could replace an elector uh, if they didn't do what they had pledged to do. In the court's decision, I would say, in, in 20, th these, this was decided on July 6th of 2020, the court's decision raised a lot of interesting questions about the Electoral College, including in particular the degree of independence that electors possess. Um, and uh, I, I'd suggest that you look at those opinions if you wanna follow out the arguments. Uh, and, and so let me just say another thing about, um, about the court. Uh, in, in the Bush v. Uh, Gore decision, um, the court in Bush v. Gore attempted to minimize or narrow the reach of its decision, pointing out, uh, as it did, that the particular circumstances of the case made it unlikely that the issues addressed by the opinion would be applicable in many other cases, All right? So it's like, the, the case, but the case has in fact been cited over 500 times right, over the last 20 years by courts across the country. So here's the language that the court uses in Bush v. Gore. Again, this is from the per curiam opinion. The court says this, the recount process in Florida in its features here described is inconsistent with the minimum procedures necessary to protect, protect the fundamental right of each voter in the special instance of a statewide recount under the authority of a single state judicial officer. Our consideration, still quoting now, our consideration is limited to the present circumstances for the problem of equal protection in election processes generally presents many complexities, right? That, that's a signal saying, don't, don't really rely on this case. It's only applicable to Bush v. Gore. But the court really can't effectively impose that limitation on other courts. That is compelling them to shy away from utilizing the precedent of Bush v. Gore, right? Um, that, uh, and lower courts have routinely done so when they thought it worthwhile to rely on the case. So that might serve as something of a warning to future courts that as much as they might try to take on a case and address it as a kind of one-off situation, any opinion or decision that it authors is likely to reverberate over time and across the judicial system and come to be relied upon by political campaigns as well 
whether the case has to do with election counts and recounts, campaign financing, or any other issue. Okay, a last point. I think it's the last point. <laughs> Political consequences of the election. Um, I'll just give you a, a, brief, a brief story. Uh, so the day after the election um, in 2000, uh, so, so that is the, the day after the popular vote when we really haven't, we don't know uh, what's going what's gonna to happen. I, I did a whole series of interviews. And I remember one in particular um, where the uh, reporter uh, was asking me a question about, uh, you know, whether I thought this was interesting. Of course, right? no one's ever paid attention to electoral college before. Um, and what I thought the consequences were going to be of the election, in particular, how close it was. Like, how might the closeness of the election affect the power or authority that the winner would be able to wield um, once he became president? And I suggested uh, to her that the manner in which the winner emerged victorious from the post-election battle was really not all that important. Because once he took office in January, took the oath of office for the president, the full power of the executive office would be in his hands. And it wouldn't be significantly hindered or limited by the close call that put him in office, right? In other words, the president doesn't get 50 plus 1% of the executive power under our constitution because he won 50 plus 1% of the electoral vote. He gets 100% of the electoral power. What would matter I suggested for the power of the president in the aftermath of a close election would be something else. And that was the makeup of the Senate, which was still very closely contested as well. So the Senate races in 2000 uh, ended up with the Democrats capturing four seats and that produced a tie in the Senate. So 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans, right? as of course we have now. And the consequence of that was that the then sitting vice president, Al Gore, would cast any tie-breaking votes on divided votes that took place from the time of the seating of the new legislature on January 3rd to January 20th, when then the newly inaugurated vice president, Dick Cheney, would become the new decisive vote in the Senate, that is in the Senate that split 50-50. So the aftermath, of the election's close result and controversy. Well, well let me put, put it this way. That, that's, that, that finishes that point, the last point. The aftermath of the election's close result and controversies led many observers to assert that the Bush presidency would likely be short, one term, and probably uneventful. As he would be, why? Well, because he would be unable to get much accomplished as a result of the wrangling over the election, right? For one thing, it delayed him getting going on the transition. Um, and as noted, the close split in the Senate. But remember, the president's constitutional authority is in no way diminished by the fact that he or she has not won an overwhelming majority of the popular vote or the electoral vote. Were that the case, most of our presidents would have seen their power severely limited over the last century and a half, as most of our elected presidents have not won a majority of the popular vote, though that has often translated into significant majorities of the electoral college vote. Whether that's desirable is another question about which of course there is great division in, in America. And of course the major event that occurred in the first year of the Bush administration the attack of September 11th forever changed many things in American politics and American foreign policy. But what might have turned out differently had George Bush not won the Florida recount battle? That is, had we had a President Al Gore uh, instead, we of course can never know. One might guess based on our history that there might not have been a significant difference in the American response to the attack of September 11th or its aftermath. Though again, that's only a guess at this point. There are a number of other things that might have turned out differently had the election turned out differently, but that's always the case. And perhaps ultimately nothing really revolutionary resulted from the final outcome 
of the court's decision uh, in Bush v. Gore or uh, the election count. Um, and with that, I've gone well beyond um, my, my charge. I hope I haven't kept you all uh, too long, um, but uh, that's, that's what I have to say. And um, I look forward to having a, a Q and A discussion with you. Uh, I think ours is slated for uh, July 8th at, at this point. Uh, so um, with that, um, I will end here and look forward to talking to you.